Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Living with Hep V, where we talk with folks who are involved in the fight against hepatitis B and liver cancer. Uh, my name is Mick Del Rosario. I'm the program manager at San Francisco Hep B Free Bay Area, where we work towards educating and screening folks in the San Francisco Bay Area about hepatitis B. Um, I'm here with, for this episode, Thaddeus Pham from Hawaii, and he's here to uh, talk with us about what he does in the fight against hepatitis B. So Thaddeus, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me today. This is very exciting. I'm glad that yeah. we can have a, a cool chat about hepatitis B. Definitely. So it's, it's our first uh, Zoom meeting as well. So, <laughs> you know, fortunately we can't fly to Hawaii, but <laughs> you know, hopefully next time we'll be able to do so. One day, yeah. One day. Um, so yeah, tell us more about yourself. Uh, you know, what your background, what got you started working in the fight against Hep B and just what you do. Sure. Yeah. So um, first of all, so I'm uh, that is Sam. You already know that <laughs> he, him. Um, I'm the viral hepatitis prevention coordinator for the Hawaii Department of Health. And I'm also co-director of our Hep Free Hawaii Coalition, which is our community-based coalition, uh, which is actually turning 10 this year. So we're very excited. We're a decade That's old. Awesome. Um, so, you know, we're getting in our, into our tweens, um, but how did we, I get into this work? So actually, um, I had an uncle who passed away from hepatitis B uh, because he was diagnosed too late and uh, just witnessing the stigma that came with that among his family members, um, you know, after no one really wanted to talk about it, no one really wanted to address it. And, uh, you know, he ended up in the hospital with, you know, ascites and liver liver failure and things like that. So for me, there's a lot of personal stake in this, um, mm -hmm. but also being a gay man in the community, I just see the parallels with HIV and just, you know, um, people shouldn't die of shame or stigma and lack of access. And I think it's really a social justice issue as much of a, a health issue as well. Totally. So that's kind of how I fell into it. Yeah. And yeah. So what do you do in your current role or like you know, what, what roles or what hats do you wear? <laughs> that is a great question, Mick. Um, I, a little bit of everything. I mean, the, the joke is, and I think people have heard it many times, is that they call me the queen of hepatitis in Hawaii um, or your majesty. And I think, you know, my, my, the queendom is quite broad. I mean, what we do in terms of hepatitis B is pretty much everything that touches on it, right? So from testing, from immunization, from linkage to care, from, you know, addressing treatment and insurance access um, to raising awareness in language, creating materials, you know, anything that really moves someone and, and our community along that continuum of care towards treatment or prevention is what we're trying to address and do. So it's a pretty big ball of wax. And, and I think it's probably what you folks are looking at at San Francisco Hep B Free and, and Bay Area Hep B Free. Yeah, and, you know, we, we definitely share uh, similar goals and similar missions. And obviously we're all in it in the fight against hepatitis B and liver cancer. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's definitely important. It's great that we, you know, we're able to have moments like these and have programs like Living with Hep B. And, you know, even though the title is Living with Hep B, that folks who might not necessarily be living with Hep B uh, are involved in the fight as well. Totally, yeah. And I think that's an important piece to bring up is like, as much as, as this is a health issue, um, our, at least our communities in Hawaii have identified that it's as much a, um, a, a, a justice issue. And uh, as you're kind of saying that the story or the living with Hep B narrative is really important for us. So just looking at all the other things that come into play to support someone who might have Hep B or effect, be affected by Hep B. Definitely. Yeah. So what would, for folks that are watching this video right now, you know, uh, what, what would you tell them about uh, hepatitis B or for someone who either might be living with Hep B or is close to someone that has hepatitis B? You know, I would say that um, there's people out here who want to help. So. You know, I know there's sometimes stigma or shame associated with it, but f reach out to people in your area uh, to get support. So whether it's you folks in the Bay Area or us in Hawaii, just know that there's people out there who are willing to help you, support you, and hear your story and address whatever concerns you need to kind of manage 
or prevent hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that's, that's with the work that your organization does, and, you know, with the Department of Health and Happy Hawaii. Um, mm -hmm. That is, tell me more about the the organization or organizations that you're <laughs> you know, that you're part of, and like how that is part of the overall uh, grand scheme of things in in this effort. Sure. Yeah. So, so I work in the Department of Health technically as a coordinator, as I was mentioning, and um, we're tasked with kind of, I think, more of that medical side, right? Like increasing testing, increasing um, care coordination, immunizations, all that stuff. Um, but unfortunately, and as you probably know, Mick, um, across the U U.S., Hep B is not well funded. From a, from a governmental perspective. So um, 10 years ago when I started this position formally, we started the Hep Free Hawaii Coalition, which I'm the co-director of with um, Heather Lusk. And through that, I think that's how we've actually made more headway. So we have the clout of the health department, but we have the community drive and the nimbleness of our coalition to move initiatives forward. And I think that's what really drives our work. Um, we currently have a statewide elimination strategy that came out called HEP Free 2030, where we're going to try to eliminate HEP B and C and A in the next 10 years in Hawaii. And part of that work um, was engaging communities over these past 10 years and, and building these partnerships and figuring out ways without as much funds to move forward and really make meaningful change around hepatitis B. Um, so yeah, I, th I think you know, we do a lot, as I mentioned, the queendom is, is broad, but um, uh, I think all of it is essential. All those different pieces are required. So that's why our coalition is really vital because it couldn't, it can't just be the health department of, alone doing it. Definitely. You know, so, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you bring up a good point. You know, a lot of, a lot of the work that you do, a lot of work that we do at Happy Free and San Francisco and just all public health outreach and public health programs, a lot of them are underfunded. And mm -hmm. especially during this time of COVID, during this pandemic, um, my hope is that people in the general public will understand that there is a need for a greater emphasis of, of public health. And, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to have those kinds of resources that allows us to outreach into communities even more and being able to uh, educate and and screen folks and you know importantly getting that ability to reach everyone and you exactly. know, I, I, what would you say is one story that has uh, you know in your work what has personally impacted uh, a person that because of your work you know that's a thank you for that question because like I mentioned before, you know, we really value the the stories and the lived experience of people to drive our work. Um, it's actually one of our main priorities in our in our statewide strategy, um, which is equity and the the and the and data actually, because we see stories as data, like as equally as important as those numbers that we collect and report are the stories of the people that we're working with and for. So I'll, I'll mention three stories that I think, and, and very briefly, um, that I think are very impactful and it kind of illustrate the what's happening, you know, uh, with Hep B in Hawaii. So one is the story of Carolyn, her father had Hep B and they didn't, similar to my story of my uncle, they didn't know about it until it was too late, right? Um, there's a lot of shame and stigma to it. So unfortunately, he passed because they addressed it and diagnosed it too late. And she became a nurse later and she became an advocate. Um, she has since moved to Washington, D.C., um, Washington State. But just for her, that experience was so harrowing. And to imagine that you could have prevented or, you know, someone from your family passing too early. It was, it was very powerful. Um, for us. The second story is the story of Kenson. He's a Marshallese man who moved to Hawaii to go to school. And um, in Marshall Islands, he was later, you know, when he went back, he was diagnosed with liver cancer and Hep B. So um, it was almost too late for him. And, you know, there was no real talk about this issue in his community. So once he got a liver transplant and he's kind of managing his hep B. Now he's a huge advocate and doing in language work. He goes to Washington DC and talks about the importance of, 
um, healthcare access for his community. So that was really powerful because it shows how much advocacy be, plays a role and how these stories are very powerful to affect policy. Mm -hmm. And the third one is someone that I, we just recently met and he's going to be sharing his story, but he talks about this perspective um, as a uh, gay man and just the importance and the intersection of, um, you know, uh, queerness and hepatitis B and how it's not really talked about in the community, um, even though it's recommended that all gay men get um, vaccinated, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all these uh, stories that all of them contribute to us and, and tell us kind of where we need to focus our efforts and um, so that we can be responsive to the needs of our local community. So those are just three quick stories that um, I think of immediately when you ask that question. Yeah, and all those stories have a profound impact, and you know, in in due part because of the work that you and and everyone there uh, are doing. And you know, Thank out you. of those stories, of, uh, out of those stories, what would you say is your proudest moment in your career so far? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. My proudest moment, um, you know, I think it's. It's, it's actually, um, uh, it's not something grand, but it's actually being able to sit in a space that um, I'm not usually in. So uh, Kenson, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Marshallese and his wife is Chukis from the Federates of Micronesia. They host a, a monthly talk story on Hep B in language and in English as well. And so um, to just raise awareness, right? It's just, it's very informal. And they invite me to this space and now I come every month and I feel welcomed. And for me, that's very, I'm very proud of that. Like, because we put in the time and we honor these communities. So to be accepted into a community that I'm not a part of really mm -hmm. um, is very powerful. And I think, I think it's really just maybe a testament to the work that our coalition does to really cultivate safety and to really um, encourage communication with our our, our diverse communities. So I find that I'm very proud of that, actually, to be able to sit in a space and feel welcome. Yeah. And, you know, that, that it's very important, especially considering the fact that hepatitis B is a disease that disproportionately affects uh, Asian Pacific Islanders. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, totally. one in 12 are chronically infected with hepatitis B. And, you know, you know, this a two out of three that are infected with hepatitis B don't know uh, their their status. Exactly. And it definitely ties into the work that we do in ensuring that people are screened and people are are even aware in the first place. Um, yeah, but I can only imagine that with the COVID pandemic, it has severely impacted the work that uh, that you all do. I know it does. It works for us. Like the fact that we're <laughs> I mean, we're doing this episode <laughs> yeah. through Zoom. I mean, besides the fact that you're in Hawaii, um, I mean, you know, what am I traveling? Otherwise, you'd doing? be like, here, right? Exactly. <laughs> we'd be there. But yeah, I mean, like for us, we've experienced having to do a lot of our education and outreach online mm -hmm. through Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, we, we here on the West Coast have. Um, the Project ECHO, which is a mm -hmm. program that allows physicians to come together, uh, learn from a case study, and to work towards being hepatitis B specialists. And, you know, that ties into the kind of work at being able to outreach to communities that might not have access to those um, healthcare services, even before the pandemic, you know, ECHO was used to uh, reach out into the rural communities. But what you see now with the COVID pandemic is that obviously people are one hesitant to to go outside of their house in the first place, um, whether it be for, you know, being able to get medical treatment for like their regular checkup. Um, so yeah, I mean, like for for you all over there, how how severe or like how much of an impact has COVID brought to your work? That's a great question. So uh, there, there's there's definitely challenges similar to what everyone else is talking about, like. Um, you know, community outreach is, is no longer happening, basically, like, you know, community fairs or these moments that we had to engage. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you're right, people are afraid to kind of deal with certain or they'll put off, right, certain health issues, because they don't want to be exposed to COVID. And we hear about that as well. Um, so 
uh, that challenge, I think, is is pro part of this, what you know, for lack of that overused term, but the new normal, right? How do we kind of address this? Um, I will say there's other, there have been some opportunities though. You mentioned Echo that you folks put on. Um, mm -hmm. Our local providers in Hawaii attend your San Francisco Echo. So it has provided more resources in a way, or just the fact that we can have this talk and it's just so normal to have a Zoom chat mm -hmm. um, is, is a, a kind of an opportunity as well. Um, in our FQHGs that we work with, so our federally qualified health centers, um, you know, they have uh, continued to provide care throughout the pandemic and provided that safe space where our folks can go who are affected by hepatitis B. So in a way, at least, even though they're not doing hepatitis B work currently because they're focused on COVID and more, you know, all these urgent issues, um, they do feel comfortable enough to keep going and engaging with their primary care there, which we're really excited about. And we're starting to kind of reintegrate hepatitis B screening and treatment back into those spaces mm -hmm. um, as, you know, as community health centers kind of figure out how to just like basically make COVID just part of the daily routine now. So um, it definitely challenges, uh, but you know, like I said, there's some opportunities that came up as well, mm -hmm. um, which we continue to leverage, I guess. Definitely, and yeah, yeah, he, it's great that you brought up that you know, folks from from uh, <laughs> your group participate in our echo sessions as well. Yeah, uh, I, you know what, Mick, I'll I'm gonna give you folks props real quick for that because of that echo. Our community health centers reached out to me and they weren't doing as much happy as I was saying, but now they're way more interested in mm -hmm. treatment and engaging and getting more training. So um, just know that like these moments that you folks provide actually have impact beyond the Bay Area. I yeah. literally got an email about that like last week. So great job. Thank you. Yeah. Well, definitely invite them to <laughs> the next one. We have it every uh, third Tuesday of the month. So for sure, we'll be, yeah, be able to get that there. Um, you bring up a good point, though. You know, with Hawaii and California um, being one of the highest percentage of uh, Asian Pacific Islanders um, in in the country. You know, how do you think uh, those higher percentages within the population uh, affects the way people pay attention to the fight against Hep B and liver cancer? Um, that's a great question too. So um, I think it can kind of cut both ways. Sometimes I've noticed in communities where um, Asian Pacific Islanders are smaller, but more like cohesive in a way, that there's more of an impetus to kind of protect the community. Um, but at the same time, when there's more Asian Pacific Islanders just overall, uh, there's just more awareness about the issues for these communities. Um, so I think it's, you know, there, uh, there's a lot of great opportunities that come with that in terms of awareness and um, access. I think something that's challenging, for example, is our immigrant, refugee, and migrant communities who are Asian Pacific Islanders um, because they have different healthcare access issues just by virtue of their citizenship status. So I think um, that's a challenge that we see a lot of in yeah. Hawaii. Yeah, I definitely think there's a cultural aspect to it as well. And yeah. Especially with uh, Lunar New Year coming up, uh, I believe it's one of the challenges that at least we face here. I'm not sure if it's similar over there in Hawaii is um, that folks don't talk about health as much, especially during the new year. and you know, one of the things that I faced in in the previous um, festivals during the before times, uh, when people were out and about in in community festivals, was you know I've had a couple of instances where uh, some folks said to me like, "Oh, you you all shouldn't you know it's a New Year festival. You shouldn't be talking about health." But I would think <laughs> that it's very important to talk about health and it's the prime opportunity to do so is with your, with your family, um, you know, for folks that are, um, you know, around our age, like millennials and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. and people who uh, went to school in the, in the United States, um, for the most part, they, you know, they might have the hepatitis B vaccine already. 
but it's right yeah uh, for our our parents and our grandparents that might have immigrated here uh, considering the fact that hepatitis b is not uh required vaccination when uh you know immigrating here it's it ties into the the cultural aspect of you know talking to your parents and grandparents about health and being mm -hmm. able to have that you know people some people would say difficult conversation it shouldn't be a, a difficult conversation you should be able to say like go ask for the hep b test to see if you haven't uh, if you don't know your status Right, exactly. I think that's a really good point. I mean, the cultural aspect is definitely a major part of our work in hepatitis B, right? And I think it's, um, I think, you know, sometimes what, what people who outside the work forget is like, our, when we say Asian Pacific Islanders, and I'm also include um, um, Africans, is like, this is not a monolithic, like, one culture, right? There's so many different cultures within the communities that we serve. So, Whereas you, you folks serve a lot more like Asian, um, we serve a lot more Pacific Islanders in terms of our focuses, right? So I'm, this is where we can learn from each other too, because I don't, uh, since we don't work around Lunar New Year as much um, with our community, our Asian communities here, we tend to work a lot more with our Pacific Islander communities and the nuances that come with that. So I, I think culture is definitely an important part of it and also to recognize that each community's culture is specific and nuanced and how do we kind of um, work um, with these communities to kind of bring up awareness while still respecting the cultural mores that they have in place and and being welcomed in those spaces at the same time so i think these are good great points to bring up for people who are starting to do this work or already doing the work mm -hmm. um, do you face any challenges over there? You know, bring up the point that you do work more with the Pacific Islander community. Um, are there any challenges when approaching folks and having that conversation? Like, are people hesitant about talking about health during, just in general, or do you see any? It's is it easier over there? Um, you know, it's. I think it's always challenging um, <laughs> to talk about hepatitis B. You know, anyway. Uh, but we, you know, we we turn to our community leaders. So I, I mentioned Kenson and Rensley already, as kind of the people who um, who lead the conversation, right? So we work with them, and we're like, so what is what do, you know your community best. So what is the best way that you can approach your community? What do you need? And we support that, right? So that we allow them to take the lead in that conversation. So for example, now during the monthly t health talk stories that they uh, have established, um, they talk a lot about COVID and then we tie in hep, hep B afterwards, right? As part of this health conversation. So, you know, in a sense, asking the people what they're interested in and then integrating hep B is what has been working for, for their communities. So those are just examples, but we really take the lead of the community leaders and then uh, they basically tell us what needs to be done and then, and then they do it. And then we just support them and provide funds or whatever we can do to kind of make it happen. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, that, I think that's one of the key things that allows for both of our organizations to be successful is being within the communities and leaning in on their expertise and right. you know, being able to understand the, the needs and wants of that respective community. And, you know, Happy mm -hmm. Free has been around since 2007. Um, and it's you know it, it has been proven to to be successful in being able to reach out to respective communities yeah um, we actually modeled our coalition after your coalition actually when we yeah. started in 2011 so yeah. we're like junior basically <laughs> <laughs> 10 years you know it's a long time and you, you know that that brings up a good point to you is, uh, you mentioned that you, there is the effort to be happy free by 2030 mm -hmm. um what would you say is another long-term goal for the organization? Obviously, besides eliminating uh, <laughs> hepatitis B, because once that happens, we're we're all good to go. We're gonna you know, ride <laughs> off to the sunset. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, we. I mean, our five prior. So, first of all, um, our this strategy that we came up with took a lot of work. And Heather and I, my co-director, always say like 
you know, the work actually started 10 years ago from our first meeting as a coalition, just building all these relationships over 10 years. And so the, the, the process required engaging with our communities over one year during the COVID pandemic, right? So there's a lot of Zooms and a lot of other kind of um, opportunities for people to give feedback. And so they identified the five priorities for us, right? And uh, to speak to, you know, our long-term goals. So um, our the five priorities are awareness, uh, you know, and education, access to services, um, advocacy, equity, which I had mentioned before, and data. And if you think about it, access is the health one, right? That's access to testing, linkage to care, care coordination, vaccination, and it's only one out of the five. So even though we might eliminate hepatitis, we're still going to be addressing awareness about it to maintain prevention. We're still going to be addressing equity issues that come with hepatitis B, you know, like healthcare access for Im immigrants and uh, refugees. Um, we're still going to be dealing with data collection to kind of monitor the situation. And we're always going to be doing advocacy for, for and with our communities to ensure that, you know, protections are in place, right? So the work will continue, I think, after we eliminate hepatitis and have a big party with you all. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I think it's in that social justice space that we had mentioned in the beginning. There's a lot of work to still continue to protect our communities, even after we eliminate hepatitis B. Definitely. And the work continues. The work continues. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Thaddeus, thank you so much, everybody. Thaddeus Pham from the Department of Health in the state of Hawaii and the uh, chair, co-chair of um, Happy Free Hawaii. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was really fun. Definitely. Thaddeus Pham, everybody. Take thanks, care, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.